Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the session No Frameworks. How can we take Agile back? By Scott Ambler. Uh, without any further ado, I will like Scott to take it away. So uh, I'm Scott Ambler. I'm the uh, co-creator of the Disponential Toolkit. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, today. I'm also the thought leader behind Agile Modeling and Agile Data. Um, so. And I've worked in uh, the rational unified process in um, object oriented software patterns. So I've been working and have either worked with or helped to create frameworks for close to 25 years. So I know a little bit about the topic and I'm going to share some ideas with you. So I'm going to start by talking about what a framework is and then I'm going to explore what some of the challenges are. Then I'm going to actually talk about what really works, and uh, I think you're going to find that very interesting. And then I'll talk about a little bit about how we can take Agile back from uh, the framework folks. So what's a framework? So there's many uh, possible definitions. Uh, there's uh, I like to take a look at frameworks from two points of view, a prescriptive framework that describes uh, in detail what to do and, and usually has one way of working. And then, of course, um, there's flexible frameworks as well. And one of the, the challenges that I see is that many of the um, many of the frameworks present themselves as flexible, and in some ways that they are, but um, they don't really tell you how to how to how to actually flex. They, you know, it's a lot of marketing rhetoric. So they tend to be prescriptive, but uh, they tend to claim to be uh, they claim to be flexible. And we'll explore uh, some of the implications of that in a few minutes. So what are, what are some of the challenges that we see in practice with frameworks? So, and when I talk about frameworks, I'm, I'm talking about things like Scrum and, and Safe and Less and, and, and others, um, Nexus, Scrum at Scale, and they're all good. You know, they, they all have some value. You know, don't, please don't get me wrong. They all have some value, um, but, you know, they, they also have some challenges. So let's, let's focus on the challenges to begin with. So frameworks tend to tend to define rules and, and belief systems, but what happens if those rules aren't applicable? So what happens when you adopt a framework that you know has a has a mindset, has an approach that doesn't really fit for your situation? And or maybe it maybe your maybe the framework is a good fit for you now, but then your then your situation changes. Uh, so for example, um, last spring, you know, we all went through some pretty major changes when COVID hit. And uh, we, just, we it was interesting that we shifted from a lot of agile coaches telling us that um, you know you can't do agile if you're if, unless you're co-located and you certainly can't do agile remotely. And now pretty much everybody's doing agile remotely. So you know reality hits sometimes. So this is this is some of the challenge with frameworks is that many of the frameworks uh, sort of left it up to you to figure this remote stuff out. The, the frameworks solve a specific problem. Uh, so Scrum solves a specific problem, Safe solves a specific problem, which is great. But if you don't actually have that problem, um, then even though the framework might be really good, it just isn't very good for you. So for example, in this picture, you know, we see a hammer. Hammers solve specific problems, but if I have, if I have to fix a, a glass, so for example, I have a crack in the, the windshield of my car right now, um, a hammer is not going to help me fix that. It might help me knock the broken glass out, but it certainly won't fix the real problem. Um, and the real question is what happens after you've solved the problem? So, you know, once you successfully adopt Scrum or successfully adopt Safe, you solve the problem. Where do you go from there? So the frameworks box you in. They, um, the language of the framework um, limits your ability to discover other ideas. Um, this is a serious problem with Scrum, actually. Um, even though you know, the Scrum terminology is interesting, it puts you in a certain mindset. And then if you only know Scrum, then it becomes very difficult for you to find techniques that are outside of Scrum or that other Scrum people aren't talking about. I, I ran into a team uh, suffering from this very problem a few days ago. And they, we were, you know, they were asking me, so how do you, you know, yeah, you know, we're solving, you know, we've got this problem that, you know, we're a scrum team, we've got this problem. And what do we do? And I said, why the heck did you Google it? Like, you know, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of articles about that, about how to solve that problem. He said, we did, but we couldn't find anything. I said, really? Because, you know, I typed away and suddenly, you know, up comes all these articles. And, oh, we never thought to look on that term. Yeah, that's because it's not a scrum term. Um, so this is, this is the challenge. The, the language is limiting. 
Um, and sometimes the frameworks present um, everything they do as a best practice. This is the one official way of doing things. Um, but what happens if the, the these best practices really aren't best? Um, what, one of the one of the things that I do is I analyze practices, and I, I I don't believe in the term best practice at all. I I have never actually found a best practice. I've been looking for over thirty years. I've never found one um, because all practices are. Um, have advantages and disadvantages. They work well in some situations and not so well in others. So you really need to think, you know, adopt the right practice in the right situation. So these best practices, they might be pretty good, but they might not be best for your situation and they might not be best at all. But they're often pitched as being best because that might be the best that they want to sell you. Um, and sometimes the frameworks are oversold. You know, we hear, um, you know, lots of interesting claims about how if, how much better things will be if you can only adopt a certain framework. Um, but what happens if, you're, if your team is already pretty good? You know, you know I've, I've seen some teams um, literally get, you know, become 10 times more productive by adopting, you know, when they made some changes. It's not because they adopted a certain framework. It's just because they changed. Um, and it, they were doing so poorly that anything would have helped them. Um, so we, we need to be realistic, you know, and there have been other situations where, you know, we've achieved small gains by adopting a certain framework and that's okay. But, but, and that's, and the reason why is because the team was already doing pretty well and the framework solved a few problems that the team had. And what do you do when your problems really aren't so easy to solve and that you really do need to rethink the way that you're working? So the flexible frameworks um, require you to use judgment and to make decisions, which is which is probably pretty good. But what do you what do you do when you don't know what your options are? You know that team I was talking about a few minutes ago when they they didn't know that there was existing solutions to the problem they had, and they didn't even know how to find them. Um, it's it's pretty hard when you you know if you don't if you can't find these these solutions and then how do you compare the options like you know because e even if, you, if even if you do know what to look for and find a you know find a bunch of ideas how do you compare them so the fundamental challenge here is these frameworks aren't magic they, they have some great ideas you know please don't get me wrong they've got some great ideas in them but they're not magic you're still gonna have to do some hard work um, and we all run into these problems that you know we might want to adopt a certain framework because it makes sense because it could possibly help but then our, the rest of the organization, our lead, and particularly our leadership, isn't ready. Um, sometimes our staff isn't sufficiently skilled, so we, you know, we'll, we'll adopt a, a straightforward framework. But you know, if we're a programming team and you know we don't have skills in automated regression testing, um, then it's, we're really going to struggle for a while. So, a fundamental question that we should be asking ourselves is how effective are frameworks in in, in practice? So, you know, the, the people who produce frameworks and who, who sell them to you, market them to you, have have claims. You know, there's case studies that tell you how wonderful they are and, you know, they'll, they'll make claims. You, you'll hear claims along the lines of you can you can do twice the amount of work in half the time. And, you know, these are these are wonderful claims. Um, but are they actually true in practice? And the observation I want to make is that the, you can't trust the people that are trying to sell you something. And you need to go elsewhere, you know, you know, get get third party advice. So the question is, is, well, where can we go? So let's let's make an assumption. So let's make us let's assume that you're adopting a framework, uh, you know, a method or a framework, you know, whatever terminology you want to use. And let's assume you do it well. You know, let, let's assume you're actually successful. Um, what actually happens? So. These sorts of adoptions follow what's known as the S curve. So at the very beginning, you know, you you know you adopt Scrum, you adopt Safe, you adopt Less, right? So you have to get some training and you get some coaching, um, and your your effectiveness goes down for a while because you're learning, right? This is normal. This is a normal thing. Your effect your effectiveness goes down for a bit of time, but then you get your act together and you things start to get better and you improve and things get better than they were before. But then the framework solves the problem. So you know. Earlier, I, I was talking about how a, a framework will address a specific type of problem. So once you solve that problem through the ado successful adoption of a framework, it doesn't really have much much more to to help you with, right? There's a lot of you know a lot of hand waving, a lot of claims get made, and you know, and it usually boils down to hire some expensive coaches 
to you know to take you from you know take you further. But for the most part, they they have nothing to say, right? Other, other than yes, of course, it's possible. It's the art of the possible. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've heard that. So the question becomes now, how you know on average, where's this peak? You know, how much better did we get? Because you know we you know we we're going to assume things worked out well, that things get better. And, and, and that's a fair assumption. So like I say, we can't trust the purveyors, the frameworks. Who can we trust? Well, there's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Don Reifer, and he earned his PhD studying the effectiveness of Agile. And he's made a business, turned it into a business. He earned his PhD a few years ago now, and he's turned it into a business where he sells the research and he consults. But the interesting thing, the, in- the interesting thing, the important thing about Dr. Reifer is he's not wedded to any of these methods. So he's not a safe guy. He's not a less guy. He's not a discipline agile guy, not a scrum guy. He's a researcher. And he's, you know, um, so, and he's looked at a lot of teams around the world. As you can see, and, you know, this date is a, a bit out of date. Um, his, his work has actually, um, I think he's over 2,000 teams now. Um, but what's interesting is that on average, and you know, when some team, you know, some organizations do better and some organizations do worse, but on average, he's seeing um, uh, improvements um, along these lines. It's still positive, it's still good, but it's nowhere near what some of the claims are. So we need to take this with a grain of salt. So yes, adopting a framework can help. On average, it does help, um, but perhaps nowhere near as much has been promised. Unless of course you're really messed up and then, yes, you know, you're probably going to see greater improvements than, um, you know, if you were doing reasonably well. So what works in practice? So I'm a firm believer in looking at the successful organizations and asking the question, who's doing really well? Who, who, do, we, who do we admire? What companies do we admire? And I, I work with executives and I, I, run a, I run this exercise with executives sometimes where we ba- I basically ask them, so identify your competitors. And you know, identify the firms that you currently compete against, and the firms that you think might be getting into your marketplace. So you know, we get stickies, and we write up a bunch of stickies, and we put them on the wall. And then you know, depending on the number of executives in the room, there could be 40, 50, 60, sometimes even seventy or eighty stick- stickies on the wall after you know five minutes of brainstorming. Then I then I go to them and I say, okay, fine. Now what I want you to do is I want you to arrange these stickies into two categories. The first category is the organizations that you're not worried about competing against, you know, know, the organizations that that don't scare you. The second category is what organizations keep you up at night? Who really worries you? Who who are you afraid to compete against? Who do you think is going to outcompete you, basically? So they move the stickies around. And then we look at the wall and then I ask the question, so of these two categories, which groups do you think are adopting agile frameworks and which groups do you think take, uh, take responsibility for their, their, for their own process? And it's interesting. The, the, the organizations that they're afraid to compete against, which is usually you know, the Amazons, the Googles, the Ebays of the world, um, or in the, the fintechs for the financial organizations, they're the ones that have figured out how to do their own pro- they, they They own their process. They evolve their process and they do c- continuous improvement over time. The organizations they're typically not worried about, almost always their traditional competitors, which look a lot like them, um, are almost always the ones they believe are adopting frameworks. So my advice would be, let's adopt what the apex predators are doing, these the Googles and the Amazons of the world. And what they do is they follow a, a lean technique called Kaizen. They do continuous improvement. And the way this method works, this strategy works, um, is shown here. And, you know, some people will do, you know, call this UDA or PDCA. Um, but the idea is that they have a ch- they have an issue. They have some sort of problem or they have something they want to improve. Then they identify, well, okay, so how can we potentially improve this problem? They also identify how are we going to measure whether or not this worked for us. Then they try out one or more potential new ways of working. And then, you know, and they give it enough time to, to potentially succeed or to fail. So after a few days, a few weeks, a few months, you know, whatever's a reasonable amount of time for that technique, then they assess the effectiveness. And if it worked out well, they adopt it. If it didn't work out well, they abandon it. And then if they're polite, um, and this is sort of my addition, they share their learnings with others. They share at least with the rest of the organization. 
And then of course they rinse and repeat. They, they keep doing this. So they improve in small steps. Um, this is a, a total quality uh, management technique from at least the 1980s. Um, and it's called Kaizen, improving in small steps. Uh, many of you are, are probably familiar with it. And if you read anything about, you know, the Amazon, you know, the Amazon case studies, the Google case studies or eBay, this is the technique that they follow to get good. This is, and they've been doing this for so long. This is why they're so good uh, because they've been on this path for 15, 20 years now and they improve in small steps over time. And then over time, they just get really, really scary. This is why they're so hyper competitive. So when you do take this sort of an approach, you get a, a process improvement curve that looks like this. You just keep improving. Now, to be fair, you know, this is a, a, you know, a high level overview. This line is really dashed, right? Because sometimes your, your experiments fail. So your you know, effectiveness goes down for a bit, but then you, you go back up again. But over time, your overall effectiveness on average improves and it keeps on improving. This is, this is what we're seeing in Amazon. This is what we're seeing in Google and many other organizations have been doing this. They just keep getting better one small step at a time. So can we do better or can we do a lot better? Um, and an a couple of interesting observations here is the Amazons and the Ebays of the world are on the leading edge. So they often have, they, they really do create new techniques and they, they figure things out. I'm sure at, you know, you've been to conferences and you've you've read articles and you, you've heard about all these really awesome techniques and these awesome things that they're doing. You know, the, the DevOps community, for example, has a lot of techniques coming out of these out of these firms. Um, so they really are leading the way. Chances are pretty good. That's not your firm. Uh, chances are pretty good. You're reasonably behind and can catch up. So because you're behind, this can, in fact, be a bit of an advantage because you can leverage the learnings of other organizations. So let's take a look at the uh, at guided continuous improvement again. So where where could we improve continuous improvement? So the thing is that third step when you try out the solutions, this is where some of the problem is, because the problem is some of your experiments fail. And yes, you know the you know the consultants will tell you, well, it's not really a failure. We're learning something, so this is good. Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to be honest with you. For the people paying the bill for these failures, they don't want to hear this, right? They've heard the word failure. And yeah, you know, some things fail, that's fine. But when you fail over and over and over again, suddenly it gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. And sometimes people, and people also tell you, well, you know, we're, we're really failing fast. We, and to be fair, that's far better than failing slowly, but it's still a failure. So can we do better? So failing fast is definitely fine, way better than failing slowly. But succeeding early is far better than that. So how do we do that? Well, if we look at the second step, if we can get better at identifying a potential new technique to experiment with, if we can identify something that's most likely going to work for the situation that we face, we will fail less often. We'll succeed more often. So the side effect of that is that we have fewer failures more successes, and that results in faster and less expensive improvement. So how do we do that? Well, there's two ways. If we have access to an experienced agile coach who has seen these sorts of problems before and can convince you to do the improvement, then that's pretty good. Problem is, you might not have, ac you might not have access to such coaches, um, and these coaches are actually few and far between. There's a lot of people out there claiming to be a coach, but they might not have the experience to actually help you solve your problems. They might be really good at, you know, working on certain frameworks, but once you get past the framework, you are now in territory where they've never gone before either. Another approach, which can be combined with coaching, and frankly, you know, a coach with a good knowledge base is a, is a very good thing, um, is if you have access to a process knowledge base like Dispin Agile, I'm going to walk you through an example of this in a minute, then you can actually leverage the learnings of others. Because even though your situation is unique, you're a, you, you are a unique person, your team is unique, you face a unique situation. So even though you're unique, the fact is, is that other teams before you, more likely thousands of teams before you, have faced similar problems and have solved that problem. So if you can get access 
to their learnings, if you can get access to the techniques they came up with to solve that problem, then you can you can also you can also adopt those techniques to solve the problem, hopefully. So where continuous improvement has a improvement curve like this, which is very good, guided continuous improvement has a steeper or has a steeper um, improvement curve, I should say, um, because there's fewer failures, more successes leads to faster improvement. It's as simple as that. So let's work through an example. So we have a challenge and our challenge is, is um, we're, we're working on a solution and we, we brought this solution to market and um, we understand our, you know, we, we understand um, our existing customers, but we're struggling to adopt, to, to attract new customers. So we don't know what features, uh, you know, potential new customers would like. So um, we're having challenges exploring scope. So when we're exploring scope, you know, we're, you know, and exploring the scope of what you're building, there's a little more to it than just writing up user stories and epics and, and good stuff like that. So when we're exploring scope, we should be asking basic questions. So how will people use our solution? What information will we collect? What data are we collecting? Um, what processes does it follow? And other questions, how will we interact with it? Um, are there any, you know, how are we going to document these requirements? How will we handle um, changing requirements? Um, so, for example, in Scrum, they talk about a, a product backlog. That's one way of doing it. There's others. Uh, there's several other ways that we can manage our, our evolving requirements, and some of which are better than product backlogs. But anyways, I just, I'll just leave that out there for you. So here's our, here's our, our challenge. So we don't understand how new customers could would want to work with our system. We don't understand, we don't know how to identify features that will attract them to our, our system, our, our solution. So um, the problem is, is we don't know how to explore, you know, we're struggling to explore usage. How will they use our system to get value? Um, so we, you know, we look at a, what's called a goal diagram and I'll show you, I'll show you an example of this in a minute. <laughs> so we've got a problem with exploring usage. So we, we look at the goal diagram and we realize, well, there's different ways we can explore usage. We could write up epics or outcomes or personas or stories or, or other techniques, right? We have options. Each of these options have advantages. So epics, you know, there's certain advantages to epics and there's certain disadvantages to epics as well. Um, they work well in some situations and not so well in others. And the same thing for these other, other techniques as well. So chances are pretty good because we're struggling to understand what potential new customers want. Um, we need to, you know, so right now our team is probably writing, it is writing up epics and stories and it's not getting the job done. So we come and we look at this, at this list and we realize, Hey, there's other techniques here. You know, if I knew something about them, maybe I could adopt them. So if you have an experienced coach right away, the experienced coach is probably going to tell you, you know, you know, just the fact that we had problems exploring, um, usage, they might clue into the fact that, Hey, personas might be the way to go. If they're not experienced with personas, because maybe they're, they're merely a scrum coach, um, then they wouldn't know that. So we would then go and look at this list and, oh, you know, maybe, and if somebody on the team had some ex, you know, greater experience, maybe they'd clue into, oh, yeah, personas. I remember personas. We did that years ago and it worked out really well. We should try this. Um, if we have no experience at all with any, with the, any of these techniques other than the ones we've been trained in, then we would have to go look them up um, in the toolkit itself. Um, sometimes, so this is an example of what we call an unordered list. All these techniques are interesting. They all have advantages and disadvantages. Um, but I can't tell you that one technique is better than another. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes the techniques are ordered. So for example, um, when we go, when we talk about the level of detail, how much detail should we capture when we write up these requirements, having a brief overview tends to be, you know, like writing up an index card. Um, or writing up, you know, something in Jira tends to be uh, good enough. Uh, having a light specification, so maybe having a, a screen sketch associated with a user story um, can be sufficient. Um, writing up a detailed specification is also an option. And then writing no documentation at all is, is also an option. So when we see lists like this with an arrow beside them, what we're indicating is that the strategies towards the top of the list 
are generally more effective than the strategies towards the bottom of the list. Now, your your mileage may vary, and you know your situation may be may be strange and require you know a certain way of working, and that's okay. That's your situation. But in general, the strategies towards the top of the list generally better than the others. When there's no arrow, I can't tell you that technique X is better than technique Y. So this is an example of a what we call a goal diagram, a process goal diagram. So this is a simple map of how do we find out know, information about exploring scope. So the idea here is that the way you read this is when we explore scope, we have certain intents or certain process decisions that we need to make. So how are we going to go about exploring usage? How are we going to go about exploring the, the domain, the data? How are we going to go about exploring the process and so on? To the right of each of these, of each of these issues, each of these intents are options. Now, we're not saying we've identified all possible options in the known universe, but we are saying that we've identified a, a pretty darn good list, and, that, and it's, it's evolving over time, enough to let you know that you've got choices, which right away gets you out of the mindset of many of these frameworks that often only tell you about one or two techniques and, tell, and present them as best practices. Because once again, there is no such thing as a best practice. All practices are contextual in nature. They might work well for you in some situations and not so well in others. This is why you need to experiment with them to see, does this work for me in the situation that I face? And then, uh, so try it out. And if it works well, adopt it. If it doesn't work well, don't adopt it. Uh, and the only way you can make better decisions is by knowing what the trade-offs are. So the trade-offs are described. So in behind this diagram are tables. So there's descriptions of what these techniques are. There's uh, references to greater detail. If you if you want to find out all there is to know about UML activity diagrams, you know there's links. If uh, and but and there's also the trade offs So what's the advantage of these techniques? What's the disadvantages? When would you want to use it? When would you not want to use each technique? So that way you can make better decisions. Because the challenge is, is your situation is unique. I don't know what your situation is. So me telling you something is the best practice is is, is deceptive. Because it might not, it, it might be a very good practice, but it might not be a good practice for you. You need to make those decisions. So don't stop blindly doing what you're told because that's what the framework tells you is the best practice. And instead, start making choices that are appropriate for, for your environment. And this is this is what the scary organizations, the Amazons and the Ebays of the world do. They experiment, they learn, they improve, and then they can they rinse and repeat. So, how can we take Agile back? How can we dig our way out of, out of framework gel? Oh, I should have also mentioned that um, earlier when I was showing the S-curve, um, Ivar Jakobsen uh, coined the term uh, method gel or framework prison. So I just wanted to give him uh, credit where credit is due. So the first thing, um, my first piece of advice is to respect yourself. Um, you know, respect is, a, is one of the fundamental concepts in Agile, and we should respect others, but we also need to respect ourselves. We should respect ourselves enough to realize that we can, in fact, think for ourselves. We can choose to own our own process. We can choose our own way of working, and we can learn and, and, and improve and get better over time. So um, first step is to respect ourselves and to realize we are intelligent people. Um, we can make decisions. I would argue that we need to go back to fundamentals. So Agile was originally about discovering what works for software development. Um, we can also do the same thing at the organization level. So as we all know, Agile is about far more than just software development. Um, and we can go back. We should really be going back to figuring out what works well um, in the situation that we face. I would also advise to be humble. We can all learn. We can all improve. We can all get better. Um, we should also be humble and recognize that even though we're unique and in a unique situation, other people have solved these problems before, we, or similar problems before at least. We can, we can learn from that. So if we're humble, we know enough to say, hey, you know what, I don't need to, to, to reinvent the wheel. I don't need to invent a new technique when chances are pretty darn good somebody else has already invented one that's been out there for a while and pr been proven in practice. So I should at least at least look, at, you know, my first step should be, let's go look to see if somebody else has already solved this problem and then let's reuse that technique and then adjust it accordingly. Um, but 
be humble enough to realize that other people have solved, you know, whatever, whatever challenge you're currently facing, chances are other people have already solved something very similar. We want to be agnostic. We, we really need to think outside of the box. And um, earlier I was talking about how the, how the terminology of framework can really limit um, your thinking. And it's really true. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I'll run workshops with people and I will, you know, start teaching them new terms and start getting to getting the question, this, these, these terms that they've been, that they think are normal. Um, but because they, because some of these terms have been around for 25 or 30 years now, um, we've forgotten the previous terminology we've forgotten and we've lost, uh, effect because of the, the inappropriate terminology, we have lost uh, just a wealth of information and techniques. Well, we haven't really lost, they're, they're still there, but we just can't find them. So by being agnostic, by realizing that there's different techniques and different strategies and that we can, you know, we can combine them from different sources, um, this is absolutely critical to our success. Um, so be very careful uh, about the terminology that you use. And even, even some of the, um, the agnostic um, stuff is not as agnostic as they think when you start looking at uh, terminology. But anyways, be as agnostic as you can. Um, and I'm just going to give you a hint. If you're still using terms like Sprint or Scrum Master, you're not agnostic. Um, but anyways, uh, and those are fine terms, but not agnostic. Um, there are no best practices, um, without a doubt. I've mentioned this uh, many, many times. So I'm not going to go into the details on that one, but there are no best practices. And like I said, um, I've been looking for, for over three decades now. Um, I hope to find a, a best practice at, at, at some point. I, you know, I, I find practices. Everybody, you know, I, I run into people pitching best practices all the time. I've never actually seen one that's best, but maybe I will one day. Who knows? So my advice is start where you are. So, you know, what are you currently doing? If you're currently a more traditional organization or you're currently doing Scrum or Safe or less, great. That's what you're doing. Good for you. Um, so whatever your current wow is, chances are pretty good you've plateaued and you don't know why. And that's okay. So you can adopt um, guided, you know, these, you know, these discipline agile guided continuous improvement techniques right away. You can get, you, you can start break, you can break out a method gel right now. Uh, if you choose to. So start where you are. Do the best that you can in the situation that you face. And you're professionals. I, I'm sure you're doing that. Um, but then improve in place. Choose to get better at what you're currently doing. Break out a method gel. Break out a framework gel. So how do you do this? Observe. And try to observe deeply. And think, think about the, you know, observe, uh, you know, recognize the situation that you're in, think about it, and then experiment. And then, of course, repeat. And this is what these, you know, validated learning techniques, these you know, guided continuous improvement, the continuous, continuous improvement strategies are all about. Um, you know, we observe, we understand, hey, we've got a problem. We think about how we could potentially, um, potentially solve it. And then we experiment with some techniques and uh, observe how well they work. And then we keep going. Optimize the whole. Look at the bigger picture. Um, a very serious challenge is over specialization. Um, we really do need to look at the bigger picture Look be and look beyond the team. Um, one of the great things about Agile is it focuses on teams. One of, the, one of the very serious problems about Agile is that it focuses on teams. Your team operates within a larger organization, within an, a larger value stream, more than likely. And you need to optimize the, the, all the flow that you're involved with, not just locally optimize what you're doing um, because a bunch of local opti optimizations can t tend to add up to a mess. So just to summarize, you know, we can, we can do this. We can take agile back. We can, we can get back to the heart of what agile was all about years ago, where it really was about owning your own process, about learning how to get better, about improving, about experimenting, about, uh, yeah, about, about doing better. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to go to questions now. I'm going to uh, dive out of my presentation and dive into the Q&A chat box. Yes. Um, so one question, um, uh, first question from uh, Vizme. Uh, most frameworks have inbuilt continuous improvement mechanisms. Um, they do and they don't. So here's an observation um, for you. Um, do you really think a framework will tell you how to abandon the framework? Does, does Scrum have improvement mechanisms in it to abandon Scrum and, say, move on to Kanban? 
um, does SAFE have um, mechanisms in place to, you know, to move beyond SAFE? No. So, yeah, you know, there's local um, improvement strategies, but um, this, this idea of going beyond what the framework wants you to do, there might be a little marketing, but they don't really give you techniques to do that. Um, so do Kaizen methods um, outperform comparison? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Um, you know, this is that, this was my point with the um, the apex predators, the Amazons, the Ebays, and the Googles of the world. Do you think they're doing agile frameworks? No, they're not. Right? They might be adopting ideas from them. Like, you know, why wouldn't you? Right? They're, they're you know they'll they'll reuse what they can. Um, but no, they're not going to limit themselves to a framework um, that that would kill them. <laughs> they wouldn't be competitive. Um, so um, another another question: Should we focus on having no frameworks? Um, well, like I said, you know, start where you are. Yeah, there, there's nothing wrong with the, you know, these, fr- you know, these, these frameworks do have value. You know, don't get me wrong. They, they really do. And you got to start somewhere. And very often adopting a framework can be your, your, your first, you know, your first improvement strategy, right? Let's, you know, adopt that framework, solve whatever problem that framework solves, improve, get better, um, but then realize, oh, now we need to do something else because we plateaued. We're now in framework gel. So then um, continue on. And, and that the next solution might be, well, let's take another step and adopt another framework. Or it might be, let's actually become a learning organization and adopt a technique like con- guided continuous improvement that is a fundamental strategy that enables you to improve you know, forever. Um, from Lexmana, and I hope I pronounced that right, um, or close. <laughs> uh, frameworks introduce so many practices. When we want to go back to basic, what are the primary metrics we can follow to learn and validate? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Uh, well, there's so many metrics. That's right. Um, so the so completely avoid articles like the best 10 metrics or the most important 10 metrics that you can adopt um, for Agile. They're, yeah, they might be nice metrics, but they might not be nice for you. So there's techniques such as guided continue, or I'm sorry, um, uh, OKR, uh, objectives and key results, um, GQM, uh, goal question metric, and uh, KPIs, um, key process improvement. So, and the basic idea is that uh, there's similar techniques. They're all slightly different, you know, slightly different strategies, but the same basic flavor. And the idea is start by asking yourself, what do we want to improve? So, if you want to improve on the quality of your work, then you'll collect quality metrics. If you want to improve on stake on customer satisfaction, then you'll adopt metrics around to measure customer satisfaction. If you want to improve both, well, then you would you know collect metrics for both of those topics. So the thing is, is what's important to you? Um, so different teams, different organizations will have different priorities. So depending on what you're currently trying to improve and where your current challenges are, that will drive the types of metrics that you need to collect. Now, there's some very common metrics that chances are pretty good that you'll you'll collect, like, like cycle time and um, and others. Um, but the but it, the metrics that you collect must be driven by what you're trying to achieve, and because what you're trying to achieve will evolve over time, so will your metrics. So, um, and this is something that we we built into the Disponential Toolkit um, years ago is that to give you options for approaching metrics and then. You know, how do we actually choose the right metrics? Um, okay. Um, here's a, a question from uh, Balaji. I was always thinking data is a framework. Is, is, um, it started out as a framework, to be fair. Um, it, although it really, it, it, we originally called it a framework because that was the term we had. And um, a few years ago, we realized that, you know, we were we were always sort of out in left field. We were... You know, we would get compared, you know, the gardeners of the world didn't know how to compare us with, like, say, Safe and Scrum and others. So, and the, and the problem was, is because we weren't, it wasn't really a framework. It was more of a toolkit. We, you know, instead of telling you what to do, we were telling you what to think. And we were giving you options. So, it, it's, in comparison, um, the frameworks basically give you a fish. They feed you for a day. They solve a certain problem, which is good, very important. They feed, you know, they keep you alive. They they feed you a fish, right? Um, whereas 
a toolkit like Discipline Agile, so we've renamed it Discipline Agile because it was about more than just delivery, but a toolkit like Discipline Agile, which is a little more complicated, to, you know, to be fair, it teaches you how to fish. It teaches you how to actually improve. And so it feeds you for life. And I think this is this is the major difference. So um, quick answer, Discipline Agile is not a framework. It's a toolkit. And that is an important distinction um, that it's worth um, thinking through. Um, okay, uh, here's a question from, from Sunil. Um, sometimes leaders, not coaches, can insist on adopting a framework. Yep, uh, they buy into the marketing rhetoric. It is what it is. Um, my hypothesis is to do so because something goes wrong. It can if if something goes wrong, it can be blamed on the framework. Um, th that might be the case. That's a bit jaded, and, and yeah, I've cer and certainly the framework would get blamed if something does go wrong. But I I I, I don't think their that's not their primary goal. Their primary goal is they they believe that framework's going to help, and it, and it might. Um, but the, the challenge is, is have they chosen the right framework or, you know, did they choose it because it has a pretty poster or did they choose it because it makes sense? Um, do, are they, is leadership able to follow through? Do they even know how to do a transformation? Do they even know how to do, do an adoption of a framework? Um, are they willing to stick with it as long as it requires? Cause it's, it's often more effort than they think. So, um, but yes. And then if they do make mistakes and mistakes often happen and the framework gets blamed. Um, but I don't think they go in with that intense, you know, um, although it does happen. Um, industry is so conditioned to think of frameworks that hearing someone talk about no frameworks might just scare them. Good. <laughs> I want to scare you. I hope you're scared. You should be scared. Um, you know, we're, at, you know, we're in, the, you know, the new normal, whatever the new normal is. Um, and nobody can tell you what the new normal is. The only thing I can tell you about the new normal is it's going to be way more competitive than the old normal. Um, anything beyond that, nobody knows what they're talking about right now. Um, but anyways, the um, yeah, you should be scared. I'm, I'm asking you to think, and that's that's pretty scary. I'm asking you to take responsibility. I'm asking you to actually make decisions and be accountable for those decisions. And yeah, that can be pretty scary if you're you you just desperately want to be told what to do. But you know what? If you want to be, you know, if you're hoping for some magic cookbook, some magic framework to solve your problem, you're a follower. You're not a leader. And in the new normal, in this hyper competitive environment that we have, are very clearly going into, the followers aren't going to make it. The leaders are going to struggle. <laughs> uh, and, and we actually saw this. You know, if you remember back, you know, to in March, April, when things started going really poorly, um, many organizations um, did really, you know, some organizations did well. Amazon thrived, eBay thrived, um, and other organizations got their heads handed to them. Um, which type of organization do you want to be? I think that's a, that's a valid question. So anyways, um, I'm out of time. Thank you for all the likes and the thumbs ups. I, I, I appreciate that. 